All right. Hi, everybody. It is October 25th, 2021. And today we have Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith with us today. Um, I, we're we're going to turn over directly to her to tell you a little bit about who she is, what she does for a living, where was she in, say, December 2019, and what the last 21, 22 months have been like. Um, but even before we do that, I just want to acknowledge that um, just within the last week, Dr. Nina Smith has been uh, named for the National Academy of Medicine. So as um, I am super excited about this, and uh, I hope you will all join me in congratulating her for this in incredible honor. So um, Marcella, over to you. I, can you just kind of take us back to, yeah, so everybody is um, I know. Awkwardly, I love it. Thank you, everybody. Awkwardly congratulating you in Zoom. <laughs> I love all the I love all the Zoom ways of congrats. So just appreciate it. Appreciate it all. Um, you're about to invite me to go back to December 2019. Is that what you're about to do? You know, the other the other day, I'm going to tell this group, and this is mostly Vegas, except for this fact that it's recorded, right? But like, um, uh, but the other day we were in a meeting. I get a chance now to work with amazing people writ large, just in many dimensions. But I also get to huddle with a, with a group of, um, of physicians who are kind of advising on COVID uh, to the president and others. And, and Dr. Tony Fauci is our senior medical advisor. And the other day we're in this meeting and Tony says, in the beginning years of the pandemic, and we all were like two snaps. Yes, right? Because that is what it feels like. How many years has it been? I mean, the first few years must have been, I don't know, March to June, right? I mean, so it is December, 2019. Oh my goodness. Um, so very long ago, but yeah, let me let me know if, if you want me to just try, try to start there. Well, I mean, I think years, that's at least 20 years ago. Yeah, and I, will, years, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think mostly kind of situate for, if you could talk us through kind of what were you doing pre-pandemic it's not like you you know were I don't know you weren't you, it's not like you were a barista somewhere and then suddenly you got the job you have so kind of where, what were you doing what was your career looking like and then how did you get involved um I want to say in the pandemic but also from from a variety of perspectives but also how you got um involved with the with the White House crew yeah so absolutely. I mean, so, you know, in the before, I was here at Yale um, and on faculty uh, here where I have been for, for a number of years. I'm a practicing internal medicine physician, so I still see patients. I do inpatient medicine only um, at this point. But, you know, kind of if, if you sort of ask me um, on the street what I do, I say I'm a physician researcher um, and I was directing my research center, which is, um, which is ERIC. It's the Equity Research and Innovation Center at Yale. Um, and we were doing a bunch of things I was really excited about doing in the research arena. I get to work with amazing faculty um, leading different research. I get to lead my own research program and, um, and also get to do a lot of teaching and working with students and interns. And, you know, that was my life in the professional front. I already like, and, and still hold several different administrative roles at Yale. And um, I was finding joy in the work and in the different spaces that I was in. Um, you know, I was a spouse, I was a parent to three young children, sort of doing, um, doing that walk as well. And certainly, can very much kind of remember in a way that like memories um, solidify kind of when they need to. But in this way, like remember standing in my living room and having the news flash come on, right? About like this new virus and sort of just standing in my living room and, and knowing enough that it like needed to stop me from like the five things I was doing at the, at the time to kind of pay, pay attention. You know, my family, we all got sick in January of 2020. Um, and just on a personal note, uh, my wife got really sick. And so she, she was in bed and we were sick enough. And I remember kind of going in to make sure she was breathing. Like there were different rooms with like every sick patient was in a different room. And I remember being like, I need to go see if she's breathing, but like it, it, we were all so sick and I was the healthiest that it didn't even dawn on me that like having to check on whether my spouse was breathing was probably like a medical emergency. Um, and the kids just had really super high temps. And I remember calling the pediatrician's office to complain about the flu vaccine, right? I was like, the flu vaccine is not working this year at all. And you need to know, cause you're gonna get overrun very soon, right? 
and and we were really sick and only in retrospect because my wife lost um uh smell and taste for uh, about eight weeks after that but you know we just didn't even know then like what that even meant or or anything um and so fast forward and then you know march 2020 and i was on service and so i would not presume i mean that just means i was doing a block and in the inpatient unit um uh, and I was there when our first COVID patient came, right? I was a teaching attending on the internal medicine floor as we tried to convert our hospital unit to a COVID unit without really knowing what we were doing. Like when I think back now, like we were literally waiting for this patient to come up in the elevator and all of us are huddled in the workroom with no mask on, right? Like not really understanding like what it means to be in a pandemic, right? And, we, and, and I remember saying to the nurses, like we're gonna need a trash can outside this room so that we can, like, you know, you have to like don, you have to put on and off these gowns. Anyway, it was just like, it's amazing. And now where we are today with the protocols and the highly, and I mean, we can sort of shift in instantaneously here in the hospital, but yeah, I think back to that day and I think back to the coming home and the hot water and the strip in the garage and kind of all that it came to mean uh, to be part of that. So anyway, I was certainly, you know, someone who was, Kind of at a place in my career where I was really, you know, had already been fully committed to thinking about um, health equity and building a research program around that to really trying to be in close partnership in the communities where I live and I'm part of it when my research is. Um, already was understanding the importance of um, power sharing in the research space, of elevating voices that are marginalized. Like I was very much there, but I just had never, of course, thought about health equity in a pandemic. Like, what does that even mean? Um, what are these considerations? And I was somewhat in that space, like a little bit coming off of a clinical rotation when, um, when I got a call from our governor. So I'm in Connecticut where Yale is uh, and Governor Lamont was standing up an advisory group to think about how to reopen the state safely. Um, and I'm still not sure, but if we weren't the first, we were one of the first where the governor wanted a part of his committee, he was going to set it up in subcommittees, a subcommittee to be focused specifically on what they called vulnerable populations, um, and asked if I would chair that subcommittee. And that's the, the sort of the first moment, maybe, when I sort of stepped into this question of policy and health equity. Now, let me, one, one thing, and then, um, like, please interrupt me so I can get us back on track. But, you know, one thing before, before the governor's phone call was, um, that a colleague of mine here at Yale, a research colleague, actually somebody who had helped train me, was a co-director of the fellowship program I went through here, reached out and said, you know, he wanted to do something on the quality of race, ethnicity in terms of COVID cases, hospitalizations, and mortality across the country. And can we write a paper together about that? Um, and we did. And, and it was posted on, in preprint looking at two things, really. One was the quality of the data. Um, which was abysmal, and I'll talk about more if of interest to anybody. Because this, this was before anyone was even tracking. Yeah, this is like yeah. maybe a, April, May or something, um, 2020. And so it was abysmal. There were really only seven states that were consistently reporting. I was really proud of my home state of Connecticut being one, but like the data were a real problem. And then the data that we did have were beginning to tell awful story about how COVID was landing in different groups in different communities um, in really disparate ways. And when we looked at age adjusted, and so I think we were the first ones to say we should be looking at these, these data in an age adjusted way. And then when we, we did that, the, the degree of the disparity was quite stark. And so it was you know around a threefold um, increase in risk of death for, um, for people identified as Black, however the data were. And then that number was pretty close to that number for, for those identifying as um, Hispanic or Latinx as well. So it, so that was, um, it, it actually got a, a lot of attention, right? In terms of a, a research paper and a research product. Um, and that was the first time in this COVID pandemic when I found myself talking to a lot of reporters and media folks about COVID and COVID-19 inequities and disparities and things like that. And so it was kind of with that, that that background, I think that when I talked to the governor's team um, and said yes to chairing this this subcommittee, that it, it was, you know, in, in hindsight, really a, a time to be calling upon 
you know, almost two decades of research training and clinical training and lived experience to bring uh, to bring to that conversation. So that's that's December 2019 to maybe May. <laughs> Um, and, and can I ask, uh, did you have, and I, I'll say I find myself in a similar situation, did you have, ha do you have any media training or oh were you just kind of like, all right, here we go? Yeah, you know, it, it, um, it, no, here we go, right? And um, so interesting because these skill sets that, you know, and I think for a long time, I've been privileged to be part of many different training programs. I have been saying to my fellows and trainees for years, the importance of media training. I've, I, I've certainly asked people to come and do media trainings. Um, I remember August 2020 being uh, sort of a, one of my fellowship programs I teach in and having the media folks come to do this training for them in the Zoom room and having them show up and they were like, you're paying attention to right, Marcel? <laughs> they were like, because we feel like you're going to like you're going to be needing and wanting to be paying attention to this. So um, but no, of course not. A reporter sent an email and was like, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. And then we were off off as they say um to the races so it is it it it, it i yes no the answer is no <laughs> all right so so you're, you're thrown in you're you're working with the governor you're still yeah. doing clinical you're training you're training your fellows um uh, like how what what happened in the fall of 20 though yeah. like did, did, how did you get you you started to become um, you started to hear three names, Vivek, Vivek. Vivek Murphy, David Kessler, Marcella Nunez-Smith. And like, you know, th those were the three names all together all at once. How yeah. did that happen? Yeah. Um, they're pretty amazing too. I like those guys. <laughs> um, so yeah, so fast forward. So, you know, Everybody, this is a this is a thing, but it's true. Life does change in an instant. I'm right now in, in my basement, depending on kind of where you find me, you find me in different spaces. I'm in my basement. And I was in this basement when um, in sort of August uh, 2020, roughly, I was giving a lecture, remember this, because I had started doing a lot of what many of us did, right? Which was make ourselves available to any audience that wanted to talk about COVID, right? And so anybody, I mean, people will reach out, community-based organizations, churches, anybody. And I would be happy, it was the same, right? It was the Zoom and um, because I do uh, some global work too and international, we've been on Zoom in my research program for years already. So I was very Zoom facile. I was like, it's fine, we can get on Zoom, we can do these things. And so I was doing like tons of town halls and talking to folks and do, like that is what it was, you know, we all try to do what we can do in a period where you feel just tremendously um, helpless, right? And so that was like one of the, the things I was doing. And I remember, standing at, at a wall that only I can see behind this computer, um, doing one of those town halls. And I got a phone call from a dear friend, a dear colleague, um, Howard Foreman, who is, um, who is a professor here. And, and he, uh, and I answered, because he never calls. Um, and I answered in the middle of this town hall, it was like, excuse me one second, and I answered. And then he said, the campaign is gonna call you in a minute, be sure you answer. And I have no idea. Oh, Rebecca, I know. I mean, I had no idea what this means. The campaign. I mean, we do a campaign every year with United Way, right? So I was like, what campaign? Who is calling? What are they talking the same about? feeling. Right? I was just like, right? You get these bizarre cryptic calls. He's like, the campaign will be calling. Be sure to answer. And I remember hanging it up and going back to the group and saying like, I'm so sorry. It's a friend of mine being weird. And like, as I was saying, be sure to get your flu shot this year as well. Like, right. And just sort of launch back in. And then in a couple of minutes, the phone did ring. It did, did ring. And, um, uh, and it, it was Jake Sullivan, who was not, nobody that I really, I mean, it, it, I didn't know what any of this meant. And he said, can you brief the candidate tomorrow morning on COVID health disparities? And I was like, and who are you again? <laughs> and I am in, and who is the candidate? Like what, what conversation are we having right now? And I have a screen right in front of me because I'm doing my Zoom town hall to tell people the little we knew, what we knew, right? Because we were still learning, but to tell them what we knew in August and to talk, I remember it was a group of, um, it was a group of parents who were really scared, right? And I remember like being this group and they were trying to hang on every word and I'm trying to have this conversation. 
but that's that's exactly what it was. And the candidate um, was uh, was Joe Biden. And the and the question was to do a briefing. Rebecca's next question should be: Have you ever done a briefing before? Um, and can you do it in a, in like ten hours from now? Was basically the question. Yeah. And I said yes, of course I can brief the candidate. <laughs> Uh, of, of course, I'd be happy to, to, to do that, yes. Now, um, I did not actually know David Kessler before. Vivek Murthy was my intern in, uh, in residency, which, oh my goodness, I tell him, I have promised that I would never <laughs> not talk about that anymore, but, but um, he was an amazing intern, of course, but Vivek was my intern. I've known Vivek for many, many, many years. Um, when I was a senior resident um, in residency training. So I've, I've known him and certainly we've had in common many people. Uh, he went to med school at Yale and we've had similar interests over time. And so we share people like Howie Foreman and Harlan Krumholz and, and many others um, in that sphere. Um, hey, by, by the way, everybody, we're name dropping a lot, but um, just oh, for reference, Jake Sullivan is the current national security advisor. Clearly the candidate is now the president. Uh, Vivek is the Surgeon General. So yeah, just, just want to make sure every, all, everybody listening is following along. <laughs> all right, my apologies. I mean, it's it, right, it's Vivek. And um, uh, who's amazing and who we have the great fortune as a nation of having as our Surgeon General. Um, and, uh, and David Kessler is, is very involved in the administration still. He's the Chief Scientific Advisor um, to, to this work. So anyway, um, can I tell my little fun vignette about this briefing too, uh, please? Because, um, so A, of course, I have never briefed anybody on anything before. And I didn't really know that that was a verb. And so it was like, can you brief this? Can you brief that? And it's like, what is happening? And um, my team is extraordinary. And I will always, every space, just to like, owe to all the teams because like I have the joy of coming and talking with all of you today, but there are so many people who are keeping like all the things, all the things, right, um, going and moving. And so my team was amazing because of course the thing I did first was to call my team, um, which is my research team at Eric and say like, do you guys have any idea what, what like we, what I should do, like what we should do now because we have to, we have to brief apparently. And so like three team members stayed up, I think all night long. Um, and I sit up with them until like, as late as I possibly could. And then the next day I said, I'm gonna brave a trip to campus where I won't have unstable internet. Cause like back then I had it um, like upgraded my wife, I, like none of the things, right? And so I was like, I'm gonna go into my office where I can be assured that I will have stable internet when I meet the candidate. Um, and felt so proud about it. Like drove into campus. So as soon as I sit down and I open up my laptop, at, um, at one of the desks in my office. And the first message that pops up is unstable internet. This is Yale University, right? <laughs> Which is like, I have never in 17 years there gotten an unstable internet message, not once. And then it pops up, unstable internet. And then we're sort of in this holding, right? Cause you have to wait cause the candidate is doing other things. And so you're like in this holding pattern. I think we waited an hour for him to show up, right? Um, and so like we're, we're in a holding pattern and the fire alarm goes off. And so now the fire, the thing is saying unstable internet, the fire alarm is going off. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I said to Jake Sullivan and I'm like, um, the fire alarm, right, is going off. And then he was like, you need to do what you need to do to be safe. And I texted one of my colleagues who had been in the office suite. And I said, if the building is really on fire, will you please text me? And <laughs> And I stayed in the office, don't ever do this. And I stayed because the candidate was 30 seconds out. Like just that moment, they were like, the candidate is 30 seconds out. And I stayed and I stayed. And literally he came on and he started talking and we were talking, the fire alarm was still going off. And right when Jake said, Dr. Dennis Smith, can you introduce yourself? And I had to like slow-mo to like unmute, the fire alarm stopped right at that moment. Um, and I'm forever grateful. But let me tell you, I do my briefings from my basement now. <laughs> like I am just, I was, I'm just over that. That was like, I, it took 10 years off my life. Just that whole thing, that unstable internet, that fire alarm, all of it. Um, but 
he was incredibly gracious. The team was incredibly gracious. Everybody was wonderful. Um, amazing. And by the way, you know, in the in the world of like doing things from our home, um, my th this this class has already met my loud dog who may start barking, and like my kid who is trying to like quietly get the dog out of the room so he stops barking. <laughs> I mean, we just have to show each other grace all the time, right? I mean, like I have three young children, I have three dogs, I have five cats, we have 10 horses. There are many things happening here. <laughs> all, all right, so tell us, um, I again, watching the time, um, what do you, like you have been the equity lead now for the, for the COVID task force in the White House, in addition to keeping your day job, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, what do you do? Like, what's your, what, what is, what are your responsibilities? What are the conversations you're having? How do you, how do you steer, how do you steer discussions? Like, what is, what is the role that you have, you have taken in this team? Yeah, I mean, it's really, so I'll talk about the different roles that, that I'm um, in, but it is so important. I'm going to try my best to not use I too much. I mean, I do use she, her pronouns, but I mean, this is definitely like a we, right? I mean, there is we all the time. And I think one of the things I'm very quick to say is, I mean, I, I'm not, right? I've never had political aspirations. I do not now have political aspirations. I'm not a politician. I'm a doctor. Um, and I was really concerned about like, is this a talking point, right? Like I was just really worried about that. Um, and I'm so grateful because it's, it's not, right? I mean, this is a, a, a real orientation for people that begins right with the president, right with the vice president and goes across everything. Um, so it's nice to be in rooms where like many people are, are, are raising the equity flags, right? So I would never, it would be erroneous to, to say that um, like I'm anywhere to make sure equity is considered, right? Because equity is already very much considered. Uh, and I'm grateful for an opportunity to bring a perspective. You know, I mean, health equity as a discipline, as a field in the research world is not new. Um, there are just luminary scholars. There is an evidence base that's there. So when we think about like, what do we need to do? Um, thankfully, there is literature there to guide us. Um, thankfully, we can invite those with lived experience and expertise in, um, which has been just probably among the most favorite thing that I get to do. Um, and hear and ask and say like, well, what do we do, right? Because um, the most affected communities always hold the knowledge, right? Always hold the solution. So, so the different roles, so, I, so I'm a senior advisor to the White House COVID-19 response team. It's a mouthful that it just tumbles off now, but I think it took a little while of practicing to get it out. Um, so there's a team in the White House that kind of is coordinating, it's, it's working across the agencies, across everywhere, but there's a, a, a core team in, in the White House. Um, Jeff Zients is our COVID coordinator. He's the lead of that team. So I huddle with that team um, at least once a day, generally, um, huddle with the leaders of the team um, often. And uh, I'm invited to kind of contribute my perspective on various things. Um, you know, we have been very focused as a, as a team on the resources, right? So PPE, testing, therapies, vaccines, right? And so kind of thinking of, I always say that's like now work, like now, like right now, you know, when I get off from you tonight, we'll be, do, it's pediatrics, right? Everybody's paying attention and get ready for children, the younger children. So it's now, it's the now work and making sure equity is at the center there. And um, I just look back with like astonishment to kind of some of the, you know, the, like getting phone calls to say, what do you think about this pharmacy program and how should we design it for equity, right? Like what? Um, I have thoughts, yes. And so, you know, but being invited into these spaces around like the design of the programs and the elements and just working with a tremendous team. And so that work is, is very now work. Um, and then I get to chair the task force, uh, which is actually a role that I chair very much as a private citizen. I chair that actually in my role as a Yale uh, faculty member and bring together 12 folks from outside the government as well as eight senior agency folks from many places within the US government to, to think about recommendations. I mean, the president made a charge to us his first full day in office to stand this task force up, to advise on mitigating COVID-19 inequities now, but also moving forward, how we prevent, um, prevent this in the future. And what an incredible journey that has been. I mean, talk about a well of inspiration and like just people 
showing up. I mean, everything, right? And so that group we have been sprinting and, and actually have our last public facing meeting this coming Thursday. So it's gonna be really hard, but we're gonna, we voted on final recommendations. There are 300 of them actually, 55 that have been prioritized. The group has been working tremendously, just fiercely. Um, will, that be, will that be public? Yeah, the recommendations are actually already posted because we voted on them last month. And then we're gonna, um, the, the re report will vote on on Thursday and should it pass the vote, then it's the next step will be submission to the president via Jeff Sykes, the COVID coordinator, um, which is also just incredible. Amazing people in that space, the federal team supporting it, all of that, um, which has been awesome. I'm also a senior advisor to Secretary Becerra, who's the Secretary for um, Health and Human Services. Um, so another role there. And then I co-chair the National Public um, Education Campaign, um, along with some other great folks, like just trying to make sure we're getting the information out there um, that's accurate, particularly around uh, vaccines and vaccination. But I also so, have a day job. I have that. my, that's not my day job. None of those are my day job. I work at Yale. I actually like sped home from the office because I wanted to be in my basement where I'm sure the internet is better when I met with y'all. And so I rushed home. So I'm still doing all my Yale things. And, you know, I came home and my kids wanted to show me that they're, they're learning how to ride their bikes, my little guys. And oh. so they're doing all of those things. Yes. So, um, you know, we, we had a member a conversation probably around December of 20, um, where um, we were trying <laughs> to go back and forth by, I, you know, maybe I'll do this thing with the government. I don't know how, how many months. Um, thank God you're still there for how much longer. So what, what the, what's the what comes next? Yeah, you know, thank you. And let me thank you just, uh, my friend. Did you tell them we went to college together? No, I didn't. <laughs> And so thank you, you know, for, um, thank you for your counsel, because I will say, <laughs> Rebecca kept me sane for, for so many, so much of this. And, um, uh, oh my gosh, yes. I, yeah, so I'm here, November. I don't even know. It's so funny. Like, I even remember this. I mean, I, 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 I went from whatever to whatever in a very fast amount of time. And I remember um, somebody sending me a link and they said political leak that you're joining the administration, right? And I was like, what? All of that whole sentence was crazy to me, right? Um, like, how do I do anything that's worth, that's leak worthy anyway? I'm like, so boring. But anyhow, it was like, it's leaked. And I remember like speeding to talk to my dean and the president of my university, my bosses who I hadn't talked to yet to be like, so there's this thing. Blah, 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 and I think, right. And I just remember all of that. Oh my God. Um, all of that. But yeah, I mean, I didn't know coming in as a pandemic. And so, um, and we've, we've seen, I mean, there, there are some things that we feel really proud of. There's obviously more work to do. I mean, we're at a place right now when it comes to COVID vaccines, we've eliminated the racial disparity in vaccination uptake in adults, right? And that, that again, that's a huge we. Like I'm looking around, each of you, you probably walk somebody to get their back. Like everybody did this, um, but it's incredible, right? It, we, we have become very accustomed in this country to racial ethnic disparities in vaccination, period. In many things, including in vaccination. Um, so it's really tremendous to be at that moment. We have to get to 100% though, right? So everybody's hanging out kind of in the mid upper 70s and we we need to get to 100. So there's more work. And of course we have children and you know, vaccine rates are very low among pregnant women and others. But you know, it is my honor to 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 show up and um and be the face of uh of this conversation in the administration, but you know, the work is being led and carried by so so many people. Um it's an honor for me to be part of the doctor's meetings and to think about clinically and other considerations. There are so many people. And so, you know, it feels really bittersweet, but I'm, I'm like, I'm beginning that transition, right? Um, out of USG. Uh, and, you know, I will always pick up the phone. It won't be Jake Sullivan again. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it um, might be you never know but it might be um but you know I'll always pick up the phone and so it's been I can't even describe right the the to be kind of 
talking with the principals and to have their first questions be about equity and their last questions be about equity. And it was just in a briefing with POTUS um, and he added 30 minutes to our conversation to talk about equity and the importance of equity. And I was like, you know, every lost bit of sleep, every everything, so worth it, right? To just have, I mean, hopefully not for this moment, hopefully for a sustained much longer period, but to have that kind of focus and intentionality around equity, it's pretty amazing. Um, so, but yeah, I'm passing all the proverbial batons. Well, um, I am so grateful for everything you've done. We are so grateful. You know, the country is so lucky for everything, for, for, for who you are, for who you've been, for, for all of your work with, with this team and for all you've done in the pandemic. And I'm just so thankful for all, all the hours of sleep that you haven't had all the time away from your family um, and, and we're, we're better for it. Ditto, thank you.